American Steamship Owners v. Dan Ocean Towing and uh, Mr. Fromm. May it please the court. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Um, my name is David Fromm. I represent the appellant American Steamship Owners Mutual Protection and Indemnity Association, as we affectionately call it, the American Club. It's a protection and indemnity um, insurance, mutual insurance association. The one issue in this case, I don't think it's a complicated issue. The issue is whether the doctrine of latches or the New York statute of limitations applies. The district judge three times held that the doctrine of latches applied. And I believe the district judge got it right three times. Unfortunately, for my client, on the fourth time, uh, the district court changed their de decision and said that the New York statute of limitations applied. I think that that was based on a faulty analysis. The analysis goes this way. You have a maritime case. And you have exclusively maritime jurisdiction. You have to look at, in determining what procedural law applies or what law applies, you look at the law of the forum. The law of the forum is general maritime law. And the general maritime law is statute of limitations is latches. Now, in this case, you have a slight twist, and that is you have a choice of law provision. And you have the standard. Well, did, you, did you draft the contract? The, did, I, I, did I personally? I know that, but did your client draft it? Absolutely. So and, if it's ambiguous, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and didn't the, didn't the client, didn't your client draft a rather broad choice of law provision? Actually, it drafted what's known as the standard choice of law provision that says that the, it says this contract of insurance between the association and the member shall be governed and construed in accordance with the laws of the state of New York. That's a standard, run-of-the-mill, everyday choice of law clause. Well, what is that? But you know, maybe standard run-of-the-mill says these rules in any contract of insurance shall be governed by whatever. So I guess the question is, you know, why not let the parties um, order their own business relationships? Uh, oh. that's, that's what contracts are for. A absolutely, and I agree with you 100%. And didn't the you opt for New York law? Absolutely. We opted. And now you want to get out of it. A absolutely not, Your Honor. The New York, when these clauses have consistently be been construed to incorporate the substantive law, not the procedural law of the jurisdiction. And there are, there's the DeBrasi case out of the Ninth Circuit that has the identical choice of law provision. Yeah, but, you know, there's, there's always been this argument, as long as I can remember, about whether statutes of limitation are substantive or procedural. Um, but the Ninth Circuit had a very interesting um, opinion in this Kagan case back in 1993, which is, a, you know, contractual choice of law provisions that don't exclude or mention statutes of limitation should be interpreted to include a statute of limitation. So what's wrong with that Ninth Circuit decision well, in Kagan? The, the Ninth Circuit decision is, um, I think they... They were looking at a different uh, choice of law provision because if you look at the Ninth Circuit decision in DeBassi. They were looking at a choice of law provision that didn't exclude or mention us of limitations, statute of limitations. Right. But, uh, and, and ours doesn't either. But if you look at our case, it just says construed by. And construed is consistently held not to include the procedural law. Now, another clause said governed by. That's a. What's the distinction? Well, California, is, the, the distinction in California, you also have to understand, is California statute of limitations is considered substantive. And same thing in Florida, right? Where in New York and, and Maryland, where this, where this case uh, emanates from, is also um, the statute of limitations is, con is construed procedurally. So if you have a standard clause in California, you'll you'll incorporate the substantive law there if that's the law that applies. And if you take a look at the, uh, the, the Bossi decision and then compare it to the Wang decision, the court 
in Wang, where they did incorporate the statute of limitations um, from Massachusetts law, to, called it a sweeping. Actually, I'm looking at the Bremen versus Zapata decision, which says, and that's from the Supreme Court, which is pretty relevant for us. Um, there's a choice of forum clause is enforceable and it can actually divest a district court of jurisdiction. Other, I, I'm just, I'm, I don't understand why in this case we don't let the parties govern their own relationship. And if you draft a contract saying that the case should be governed by New York law and then come before us and say, well, we don't want to be bound by that. Um, I mean, I don't know why we should let you out of it. I, I'm, I'm not asking to be let out of it, Your Honor. I'm asking you to interpret um, New York law the way New York law would interpret it. If this case was in front of a New York court, the New York court would not apply in an admiralty case the, statute of, the New York statute of limitations. It would apply the maritime doctrine of latches. Now, I'm not asking to be let out of anything. I'm not asking for any favors. I'm not asking for any other interpretation than interpretation of what New York courts and admiralty courts would interpret this clause. And in fact, Maryland would interpret it the same way because Maryland in an admiralty case wouldn't apply the statute of limitations. So the statute of limitations is purely a procedural matter. And even if you look at the cases, the district court never made that announce. The district court just said, just said similar to what you're saying, Your Honor, um, and with, with all due respect, I don't think it's right, is the, the district court said, all right, you know, you said New York law applied this when New York law applied and every law in New York applies. That's not, that's not what the clause means and that's not what the New York courts would hold. You know what, though? It, it, it doesn't it suggest that, that you're stuck with an am, ambiguous or potentially ambiguous <clears throat> provision in a contract that's got to be construed against you? Well, at the, there's a case... Um, well, no, if you could just answer the question. Yes, yes. There's, I, the, the, that clause is a standard clause used in hundreds of contracts. No court has ever, ever, ever determined that that clause is ambiguous. Well, I tend to think it isn't well, either. Well, but, the, uh, but I'm, and, and, and perhaps, uh, but you seem to be arguing behind the language, telling us what a New York court would do, and that suggests to me that maybe the language itself is not self-evident. Well, the, I, I, all I can tell you is, what the Alaska, um, the, the Alaska District Court in the Alaska Airlines case, which is cited in our brief, specifically rejected that argument, said this is a standard forum collection, selection clause and there's nothing ambiguous. Did the and, District Court find it ambiguous? Is that why she changed her mind? No, no, never. The District Court, that, that issue of ambiguity was never even raised in the District Court. First time it was raised, it was in, it was in this court, as I, as, as I understand the record. So, I, and, and you know, was, it was um, rejected by the Alaska uh, District Court. Also, what's ambiguous? What word is ambiguous? Governed and construed is not an ambiguous term. It's been held by numerous courts, they're all cited in our brief, to incorporate the substantive law and not the procedural law. What about governed by? That that exact language, governed by. I think where you where you where the courts have said that that uh, procedural law will apply, there's been cases that said um, governed by and, and and enforced, and they that that that, that that's what the um, California court uh, said was sweeping language, because uh, the word enforced was there. Do you agree with that analysis? I have a little difficulty with that, that analysis. Here we're but kind of splitting hairs. Yeah, they, they, they seem to be splitting hairs. I, I have a little difficulty with that analysis, but that's what the court said. It's not, you know, not for me to tell the court that it's wrong. It's, it's so just what do you different. Say, what do you say the language here would have had to have said in order to incorporate uh, the statute of limitations? Well, I would say that it, it Other would, than we incorporate the statute of limitations. No, the proceed, substantive and procedural law. If that's what if that's if that's what you want to you want to incorporate, or you throw or you put in a statute of limitations, 
It's done all the time. A lot of the cases they rely on, court, um, courts have said, you can put your own statute of limitations in a contract. And in fact, there is, a, there is sort of a statute of limitation in ours for claims uh, against the club, which is two years. <clears throat> but if you want to put in a statute of limitations, you put it in. But I think there's, you know, there's just a, um, there isn't one case, really, there's not one case that supports their position that you can, that this clause, this particular clause, um, contains, uh, incorporates procedural law. There, there, there's no case. They haven't cited one. In fact, the district court in her, in her decision noted that they, uh, on two occasions, that they haven't cited one case that supports the position of that this clause incorporates the, um, the uh, statute of limitations of a state. And, you know, it's interesting, the two cases that the district court relied on, um, I think, I think um, there are some, some discussion on, and I just want to briefly touch them. Uh, one is the Cooper case, and that was a Florida case, again, and they applied um, Dutch law there, and really wasn't a statute of limitations. It was a statute of repose. And the case law is clear that a statute of repose, because it affects a right, a right not a remedy, I suppose they get it mixed up, because um, it is a lot of semantics, but it's, it's what, the, what the courts say, a uh, statute of repose is not, is not a, is substantive, as opposed to a statute of limitations. Again, it's splitting hairs, but that's how the, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's how the law is, and we take, we take our cases based on, uh, you know, the decisions and uh, stare decisis. The um, other case is the um, case out of the um, um, uh, out of ca uh, out of California, the Italia Maritana case, and that's the case where um, they again took a they said the statute of limitations did apply, and they said this is a sweeping. Um, decision. Uh, it was a district court case. It's unpublished, not necessarily binding. But again, you had that. Um, you had a choice of law that said construed, interpreted, and enforced. And that case actually, although it's out there, the district judge reversed himself anyway in a subsequent decision. And instead of applying the uh, the um, California statute of limitations, and I find this all a little murky in the sense that. Um uh, as I indicated at the beginning, there's a big debate um, over whether the statute of limitations um, is substantive or procedural. Um, and there's another big, there's another debate about whether New York would hold, New York law would hold that this choice of law provision um, incorporates a statute of limitations. And the whole question <clears throat> seems to me um, to have a certain murky and ambiguous quality about it. And when you get back to Judge Keenan's question at the outset, um, if this is a close question um, and, uh, and a bit of a difficult question, why not just go back to the basic insurance law um, maxim, which we follow all the time, which is that you construe insurance contracts in cases of ambiguity against the drafter. Well, the, 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 the problem with that analysis is that it's not an, an ambiguous stat, it's not an ambiguous clause. No court has ever held that clause to be ambiguous. Every court that's that's dealt with that statute has, you know, has found it to be well, that it didn't incorporate the statute well, of limitations. What about the, what about the Kagan case? I don't know. The Kagan case just says general propositions of law. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. I don't believe it. It it holds anything near with what you're saying, Your Honor. I mean, maybe I have to look at it again, but I don't. I don't believe believe that at all, especially in light of the other two cases in California. The, there's, what, what word is ambiguous? What word is, 
in what word in that clause? I mean, they don't they don't say what word's ambiguous. They say it's ambiguous, which they raise for the first time here. And what's ambiguous about it? There's, there's no you can't point to a word that's ambiguous. And you have the Alaska Supreme Court, Alaska District Court, saying it's not ambiguous. It's a it's, it's a garden variety um, choice of law clause. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> May it please the court. I'm Alan von Spiegelfeld. I represent Dan Ocean Towing. And we are here today because we feel that the district court ruled correctly in her final ruling. And in regards to something that Judge Wilkinson asked and was responded to by my opposing counsel in regards to the Kagan case, as you refer to it, that particular case does not call for the enforcement or the uh, going to court over it. It says almost virtually the same wording as ours, governed by the laws of Massachusetts in all questions pertaining to the validity and construction of such rights and obligations shall be determined in accordance with such law. That's, ours is shorter, but it's virtually the same meaning. But more importantly, as the court has already pointed out, this is a contract that was created by the appellant. And the appellant would tell the court that it is a very simple provision that just has calls for the choice of law or a simple choice. I think they call it a generic choice of law provision. But when one looks at appendix number 101, one sees that the choice of law provision is a part of a long section, section 15 of rule one. That section provides procedures whereby the appellant or where the Dan Ocean Towing would have to go to the appellant in order to get permission to sue would have to be bound by a two year limitation. And then it goes on to say, after going through numerous procedural things, these rules and any contracts of insurance between the association and a member shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the law of the state of New York. Let's, let's. Now, I'm a simple person, but a statute of limitations is the law of the state of New York. And maybe it isn't ambiguous, but if it isn't ambiguous, it isn't ambiguous because a normal person would read that to include the statutes of the state of New York. And this, the state of New York provides a six-year statute of limitations. Now, this is at the same time that the, this is a, a manuscript document. It is not just a simple agreement between two parties. This isn't an agreement where, in fact, as has been pointed out, these are the rules of the club. It's not a, it's not a contract as one normally has a contract where both sides sign and agree to the terms. These terms were foisted on Dan Ocean Towing, and they had no choice in saying, well, what do you mean by the laws of New York? Does that include substantive and procedural? Not that a tugboat owner would ask that question in the first place, but were they, were they to ask it, they wouldn't have had the opportunity. Um, the statement was made that there is no cases that support the position of the appellee. And that's absolutely not correct. The case of Cooper versus Mer Meridian Yacht is a maritime case. And in that maritime case, the court held that in maritime cases where there is a choice of law provision, they will apply the statute of limitation of the chosen law. That is a maritime case. Italia Maritima, SPA, which is a California case, again, did exactly the same thing. It applied the statute of limitation that was set forth in the um, choice of law provision. 
Appellant argued that the district court in Italia reversed itself, and that's absolutely not true. In Italia, what the district court did do is it said that the plaintiff who had been precluded from proceeding by the statute of limitation would be allowed on an indemnity claim to proceed because the indemnity claim hadn't become right yet. Well, your position at bottom is simple, and I don't mean by that to indicate that it's wrong, but your position is the parties bargained for the law of New York. And when you look at the law of New York without going through this step and that step and asking whether this is maritime and whether it's not and all the rest, New York has a statute, a general statute of six years. That's correct. And that is the most explicit provision of the law of New York. Six-year statute of limitations is part of New York law. Your Honor, I can't say it better. You just said it first. Well, you repeated it better than I said it in the first place. But that is the simple, that is the essence. And the argument over procedural versus substantive, in all fairness, is something of a ruse because the cases that have used that in the past actually are no longer really valid because, as the court has pointed out, there's a... The question is, what is it likely, what did the parties themselves bargain for? And what the parties themselves bargained for would probably trump the question of whether something is substantive or procedural. And it would probably, even in this Zaman case, it says a choice of law provision can oust jurisdiction. And so the question is, in this kind of situation particularly, you want to have two private parties be able to govern their relationship between themselves. And they bargain for New York law. And statute of limitations under New York law is six years. And so that seems to me to give the most meaningful effect to what the parties wanted. I agree with you wholeheartedly, especially when one looks at that provision and sees that there is a statute of limitation procedure in there. I agree with you. Any questions? We have no questions. Thank you. I'd like to just make two points. I think there was a disconnect between, at least I was disconnected with you, Judge Wilkinson, when you were talking about the Keegan case. Because I call it the Wang Labs case. It's Wang Labs v. Keegan. And as my learned adversary was discussing the case, I went back and read it. And what Keegan clearly says is that there was a broad clause there. The clause said it was governed by the law of Massachusetts in all questions pertaining to the validity, construction of such rights and obligations shall be determined in accordance with Massachusetts law. Well, that has some additional language, I'll grant you. But I'm having trouble seeing how that's any broader than what we have here. Well, the court in Keegan specifically said that that's sweeping language and is different than the Desbrasi case, which had the exact same language. Right. They made that distinction. In their circuit's case law, but that doesn't mean that that's right. No, of course not. I mean, this court decides what's right. But there's another point. Well, we decide for ourselves right or wrong, but we're going to decide. Right. But there's another point. And I think, Judge Wilkinson, you said the party should, you know, the contract says something and they should, that's what they bargained for. Well, the law for the last hundred years at least has been in maritime cases, the doctrine of latches applies. 
And this form, so this, excuse me, this conflict um, for um, choice of law provision, I get mixed up between forum selection, conflict of laws, and cho choice of law provision. This choice of law provision has consistently been held not to incorporate statute of limitations. So when the parties made this deal and, and Dan Ocean decided to become a member of our club, they act as an insurer as well as an insured, they, everybody presumably knew what the law meant because they had a hundred years of law that said in maritime cases, latches apply, and they had umpteen years of law where this clause never had been interpreted to um, incorporate a well, statute of limitations. Take, but you have to take a jump to get there. You don't have to take a jump if you just look at New York law and see that there's a six-year statute of limitations. If you want to go your, your route, you have to decide what's maritime, number one, and you have to decide what's latches, number two, and it just becomes more complex. It's, and it, it, becomes, it becomes more complicated. I, I listened to the, uh, the other, the case that was argued right before us. That was a complex analysis. That seemed to me to be a complex analysis. This doesn't seem to me to be a complex analysis to make a decision on whether a statute of limitations is procedural. You drafted, or, the, you drafted the contract, and if it, you know, if, again, if there's, a, if there's doubt about it, it goes... It, it seems to me to go against you. I, I, I think you have a number of problems. One is the, the definitional problem of maritime. Another is the application of latches. The, number, the third is the contracts of insurance are generally interpreted against the drafter. A fourth problem is you've got, gone for the laws of New York, and I know you say that, well, these choice of law provisions under the the state's law are never been held to apply to maritime provisions. But, you know, again, if you look at it in just a very simple way, New York has a six-year statute of limitations that applies to but, actions under contract. But, but that's not the proper analysis. The, first okay, of all, well, you, we're running round and round the pole. Well, no, well but, but you have to start off. You have to start off with what's this case? It's a maritime case. What's the conflict of law? What law do you apply? You apply the law of the forum. And that, that's where you have to start. You have to start from a foundation. You can't just jump to this that says New York law and therefore every law in New York applies. You have to, you have to do the analysis. And it's just, a contract, isn't it? Absolutely, so, it's a contract. What, is this, what does the six year statute it's, of limitations apply to? Contract? They. They apply to contracts that are governed by procedural law in New York. They don't, they don't apply to maritime contracts. That, that, that's the whole point, because maritime is, is you know, it, it happens all over the place. You know, ships go here, ships go there. That's why we have a universal maritime. Uh, so, you know, we have a maritime jurisdiction, and we have universal laws. And the, the Supreme Court in Wilburn Boat says... You look to first to see if there's well, a union. But they're going to be, you know, you're talking about this interest in uniformity, but New York law is going to govern the interpretation of all kinds of provisions in that contract. And you're going to get disuniformity that way. And so, you know, the parties can opt for that. But, you know, uniformity is not just important um, with respect to a statute of limitations, I don't know how many substantive provisions there are in contracts, but your concern over uniformity notwithstanding, New York law is going to apply to all of them. It, it will apply to the substantive, and it doesn't apply to the procedural. No. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't apply the New York rule on depositions to, the, to this case, on what you can object no, to. But in you, you, you and I both know that statute of limitations belongs in that right at the very tipping point of that debate about what's substantive and what's procedural. And, you know, they're wonderful law school hypotheticals made out of that, of, what, of how do we characterize them. But I, I don't know. We've, you've, you've made your point and you've made it very well. But I, you can... I, 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 I can't change your, I can't no, I, change I, your I, mind, but I, I, I just would urge the court to, to please 
do the proper analysis, at least what I think is the proper analysis. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much.